OK, we're on to number 10 now, Article 10. Animals bred for use in procedures. 1. Member states shall ensure that animals belonging to the species listed in Annex 1, and I'll look at that in a minute, may only be used in procedures where those animals have been bred for use in procedures. Article 1 continues, however, from the date set out in Annex 2, and we'll have a look at that in a minute, Member states shall ensure that non-human primates listed therein may be used in procedures only where they are the offspring of non-human primates which have been bred in captivity or where they are sourced from self-sustaining colonies. For the purposes of this article, a self-sustaining colony means a colony in which animals are bred only within the colony or sourced from other colonies but not taken from the wild and where the animals are kept in a way that ensures that they are accustomed to humans. The third paragraph reads, The Commission shall, in consultation with Member States and Stakeholders, conduct a feasibility study which shall include an animal health and welfare assessment of the requirement laid down in the second subparagraph. The study shall be published no later than the 10th of November 2017. It shall be accompanied, where appropriate, by proposals for amendments to Annex 2. So we'll have a look at those two annexes now. OK, this is the Annex 1, list of animals referred to in Article 10. That was the first paragraph. You've got the mouse, the rat, the guinea pig, the Syrian golden hamster, the Chinese hamster, the Mongolian gerbil, the rabbit, the dog, the cat, all species of non-human primate, the frog and the zebra fish. And it's just saying that you have to go to a reputable dealer to buy these animals, to purchase these animals. You cannot just go down to the pet shop and experiment on animals from the pet shop. You have to go to a supplier who specifically breeds animals for animal experiments. OK, this is Annex 2. So if you're a marmoset from the 1st of January 2013, it looks like... You won't be able to be taken from the wild anymore, if my understanding of this is correct. However, if you're a Sinomogulus monkey or a Rhesus monkey, or any other species of non-human primate, it's five years after the publication of the feasibility study referred to in Article 10.1, fourth subparagraph, provided the study does not recommend extended period. Now that date is 10th of November... 2017 so that means five years after the publication of Spirit of Spirit, so that means 2022 so unfortunately if you're a rhesus monkey or any other type of monkey really other than a marmoset it looks like you're still going to be taken from the wild okay this is part two and three of article 10 and part two reads the Commission shall keep under review the use of sourcing non-human primates from self-sustaining colonies and in consultation with the member states and stakeholders conduct a study to analyse the feasibility of sourcing animals only from self-sustaining colonies. The study shall be published no later than 10th of November 2022. Anyway, part 3 says competent authorities may grant exemptions from paragraph 1 on the basis of of scientific justification so under some circumstances you can experiment on animals that have been sourced from suppliers not specifically breeding them for procedures okay on to article 11 now stray and feral animals of domestic species one reads stray and feral animals of domestic species shall not be used in procedures Two, the competent authorities may only grant exemptions from paragraph one subject to the following conditions. A, there is an essential need for studies concerning the health and welfare of the animals or serious threats to the environment or to human or animal health. And B, there is scientific justification to the effect that the purpose of the procedure can be achieved only by the use of a stray or feral animal. Before we move on to have a look at the draft guidance on the operation of the Animal Scientific Procedures Act 1986 as amended, which was written in January 2013 by the Home Office. Let's quickly look at the House of Commons where there was an early day motion. Here is a slide of early day motion 193, transposition of EU Directive 210-63-EU and 
animal experiments. It reads that this house opposes the removal of the ban on using stray cats and dogs in experiments in the transposition of European Union Directive 2010-63-EU and supports the call by the British Union for the abolition of vivisection for a full debate on the floor of the house to examine this and other serious concerns before the transposition process is completed. Uh, this slide is about Amendment 193A1 and it goes opposes the use of stray cats and dogs in experiments and notes that in the RSPCA report that they have looked very carefully into the use of stray animals for research and believe there will not in fact be any change to the current situation in the UK and that the intention of the Home Office remains not to allow the use of any stray animals. So... You can see the House of Parliament here a little bit worried that the EU directive will water down the provisions that we have in our own national legislation. I think I mentioned this right at the very beginning of this piece. So anyway, we'll go on now to have a look at the uh, ASPA, the Animal Scientific Procedures Act draft document that I also said at the beginning of this piece we'd have a look at. Here is the front cover of the ASPA Draft Guidance January 2013 that was published by the Home Office. It says Draft Guidance on the Operation of the Animals Scientific Procedures Act 1986 as amended. Obviously this is just a draft guidance and eventually they will put the whole guidance, the finished guidance, out to the public. Uh, OK, let's have a little look in it, see what it says about stray and feral cats and dogs and animal experiments. OK, to appease the worry in Parliament and anybody else, the Home Office says here on the second and third line, we cannot, by we they mean the Home Office, we cannot authorise the use of stray cats and dogs. And it goes on, and you, can, and you may only use feral animals in exceptional circumstances. So the Home Office is making it perfectly clear here that you cannot use stray animals in animal experiments in UK laboratories. OK, we're on to Article 13 now. We have had a look at this article earlier on in Part 1. Uh, it says, Choice of methods. Without prejudice to national legislation prohibiting certain types of methods, member states shall ensure that a procedure is not carried out if another method or testing strategy for obtaining results sought, not entailing the use of a live animal, is recognised under the legislation of the Union. So there are a few replacement tests that have been validated and approved by the European Union, and you have to use these instead of using a live animal if one of them is available. Technically, it's not just enough to be validated by the EU. They have to be recognised by the EU's legislation. So there is a little technical difference there. OK, two, in choosing between procedures, those which to the greatest extent meet the following requirements shall be selected. A, use the minimum number of animals. B, involve animals with the lowest capacity to experience pain, suffering, distress or lasting harm. C. Cause the least pain, suffering, distress or lasting harm and are most likely to provide satisfactory results. Part 3 reads, Death as the end point of a procedure shall be avoided as far as possible and replaced by early and humane end points. Where death as the end point is unavoidable, the procedure shall be designed so as to A. Result in the deaths of as few animals as possible and B. Reduce the duration and intensity of suffering to the animal to the minimum possible and, as far as possible, ensure a painless death. OK, we're looking, say, at LD50 tests here, where 50% of the animals die, so a toxicity test can be ascertained. So these are incredibly painful deaths, and they're just saying that you have to use... Uh, validated alternatives but the validated alternatives mean that they are nearly dead so they're not that much better okay we're on to article 14 now anesthesia number one reads member states shall ensure that unless it is inappropriate procedures are carried out under general or local anesthesia and that analgesia or another appropriate method is used to ensure that pain suffering and distress are kept to a minimum 
Procedures that involve serious injuries that may cause severe pain shall not be carried out without anaesthesia. Part 2 reads, when deciding on the appropriateness of using anaesthesia, the following shall be taken into account. A. Whether anaesthesia is judged to be more traumatic to the animal than the procedure itself. And B. Whether anaesthesia is incompatible with the purpose of the procedure. Number 3 reads, member states shall ensure that animals are not given any drug to stop or restrict their showing pain without an adequate level of anaesthesia or analgesia. They're talking about muscle blocking drugs there, neuromuscular blocking drugs that cause paralysis, uh, where the animal could feel pain but be fully paralysed. Anyway, the last two lines read, In these cases, a scientific justification shall be provided, accompanied by the details of the anaesthetic or analgesic regime. Part 4 reads, An animal which may suffer pain once anaesthesia has worn off shall be treated with pre-emptive and post-operative analgesics or other appropriate pain-relieving methods, provided that it is compatible with the purpose of the procedure. See, that is the problem when it says provided that it is compatible with the purpose of the procedure. For instance, things like toxicity tests, it could alter the results if you're using anaesthesia. So this is why they don't have to use anaesthetics in all cases, and we'll see that in a minute. Anyway, number five reads, As soon as the purpose of the procedure has been achieved, appropriate action shall be taken to minimise the suffering of the animal. OK, we're back at Article 14.1 now. This is Member States shall ensure that unless it is inappropriate, procedures are carried out under general or local anaesthesia. And point 2B says whether anaesthesia is incompatible with the purpose of the procedure. So both of these are kind of like get-out clauses for the vivisectors not to have to use anaesthesia. I mean, it gives the impression this article that anaesthesia is used all the time. Anyway, we'll have a look at Andrew Knight's book, The Cost and Benefits of Animal Experiments. OK, here is page 26 from Andrew Knight's book, and it reads, At the time of writing, anaesthetic use was not directly indicated in EU reports. And I've read this directive, and I can't see that it's going to be in EU reports from now on in either. So that's a little bit worrying. Anyway, it goes on, all those of Australia and Canada. It was, however, indicated in the reports of Great Britain, the seventh largest animal user in 2005. Paragraph 2 reads, in 2009, 2.4 million British procedures, 66.7% of the overall total, which is two-thirds, did not use any form of anaesthesia. General anaesthesia was provided throughout or at the end of terminal procedures in approximately 342,300 cases, which was only 9.5% of the overall total in 2009. So far from being the norm, it's actually in the minority of cases that anaesthesia is actually used. For these figures to be truly insightful, however, it would be helpful if analgesic use was also included in the statistics.